Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is a verse from the Gospel reading appointed for today, Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. This is the text. The people who pick out our readings for each Sunday in the three-year series that we use in their wisdom, for whatever reason, have chosen not to have any readings from the Old Testament all throughout the Easter season. We have one Old Testament reading on Easter Sunday, but then we don't have an actual reading from the Old Testament again until Pentecost, sometime later in May. And so you makes you wonder, well, does the Old Testament not say anything about Easter, about the resurrection of the dead? That's not the case at all. The Old Testament has a lot to say about the resurrection of the body. From Daniel chapter 12, it says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteous to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And then there's Ezekiel chapter 37. I will open your graves and raise you from your graves. And so many other passages also could be taken from the Old Testament, which testify to the resurrection of the body that we celebrate at Easter time. So I looked at the readings that are coming up that have been chosen, and as it turns out, every Sunday, even though we don't have an actual reading from the Old Testament, every Sunday there's some kind of reference, one or more references, to something taught in the Old Testament. So we're going to take a quick look at those, beginning with this Sunday. From Acts chapter 3, we have Peter, who is explaining and expounding on what has just happened in the portico of Solomon. Peter and John had just healed a lame man, and he was out there running around in perfect health, and everybody was wondering, how did this happen? How did this miracle happen? And Peter explains that it was not by any human effort, but by faith in Jesus that this happened. And then he goes on and he says, <clears throat> he refers to God in words that come directly from the Old Testament. He refers to God as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers. That's exactly how God speaks of himself when he appears to Moses in the burning bush. And it's the same reference to God that Jesus himself uses in Matthew chapter 22. And then later Peter says, what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that this Christ should suffer, he thus fulfilled. Now that's quite a turnaround for Peter. If you remember, back in Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus started talking about suffering, going to Jerusalem and dying on the cross, Peter takes Jesus aside and says to him, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And then Jesus takes turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. It's going to happen. I'm going to die. Because the prophets said, it shall be so. And so, that, and so now we have Peter in our reading for today saying, that's what the prophets said. All the prophets foretold that the Christ must suffer. Prophecy fulfilled. Then in the gospel reading for today, as we read earlier, Jesus is meeting with his disciples on the evening of the first Easter, and he opens their minds to understand the scriptures, namely the Old Testament. He tells them, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he did. The next Sunday will be Good Shepherd Sunday. And I think there's a few passages in the Old Testament that talk about Jesus, the Good Shepherd, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, Ezekiel 34, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God, I will seek the lost, I will bring back the strayed, I will bind up the injured, I will strengthen the weak. Next Sunday also features one of the greatest passages in the Old Testament, from the Easter Psalm, Psalm 118, where Peter says, 
Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, which pretty much summarizes all of Holy Week and Easter in Jesus's rejection, condemnation, and death, and then becoming our cornerstone by rising from the dead. And after Peter says this, he adds the words, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Then the next week, the fifth Sunday of Easter, we have the story of one of the early leaders of the church by the name of Philip encountering an Ethiopian eunuch along the road to Gaza. And as Philip comes alongside the Ethiopian, he's reading from the Old Testament, a passage from Isaiah. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. And the Ethiopian asks Philip, who's he talking about? And Philip takes that, starts with that very passage and explains to the Ethiopian the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Ethiopian believes it. They stop the chariot so that they can get out and Philip baptizes the Ethiopian, and then he goes on his way rejoicing. Then the next week, the sixth Sunday of Easter, we see Peter preaching in the home of Cornelius the Centurion in Caesarea. And even though he's preaching to a group of Gentiles, he still refers to the Old Testament. He says, to Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And what happened next is pretty amazing. As soon as Peter said this, the Holy Spirit fell on all the people there in Cornelius's house, and they became believers. As soon as Peter made this reference to Jesus fulfilling all those prophecies. And then finally, on the seventh Sunday of Easter, we have a story from Acts chapter one, when the disciples met together to decide who should replace Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. And as the basis for doing so, Peter quotes again from the Old Testament, Psalm 109, let another take his office. So even though there are no actual readings from the Old Testament, pretty much every Sunday going forward until we have another Old Testament reading, there are at least one reference to the Old Testament every single Sunday. And this is what one would expect as the apostles went out preaching the gospel for the first time, they were preaching to Jewish people. And the Jews, for the Jews, if you did not refer to their scriptures, if you did not base what you were saying on the Old Testament, they didn't want to hear from you. And so that's exactly what they did. They showed from the Old Testament how all this has now been fulfilled. And the same applies today for preachers. If you can't show that what you're preaching comes from the Bible, which has now been added to with the New Testament. We have Old and New Testament. If you cannot show that what you are saying is based on Holy Scripture, no matter how eloquent you may be, it will not produce God-pleasing fruit. God will not bless it. Everything must be based on Scriptures and shown from Scripture. That is the norm for all that we preach and proclaim. And when it comes to scripture, it all has one, just one central meaning, the life and salvation we have through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things I appreciate about the Old Testament prophetic writings, which keep being referred to over and over again, especially the prophets, they remind us that there is something more even after Easter, that even after Easter, there's something to look forward to, and that is the full restoration of everything. That everything in this whole world is someday going to be perfectly restored to its original condition. And the prophets, even long before Jesus came, the prophets made prophecies about the end of the world when everything would be completely 100% restored. There's a passage from Job chapter 19 where Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Or Isaiah 25, he will swallow up death forever. 
The Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. For Micah chapter 4. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they le learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. The complete restoration of everything is yet to come. <clears throat> the only book in the New Testament that even comes close to this beautiful view of the restoration of all things is the book of Revelation, which of course has many scary things in it, but <clears throat> it also talks about the new heavens and the new earth. That heaven will be paved with streets of gold and the gates will be made of pearl and everything will be perfect. That's in the book of Revelation. In our epistle reading for today, 1 John chapter 3, it says, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And also Peter talks about in the first reading for today from Acts chapter 3, he says, he talks about the restoration, the complete restoration of all things that we're still waiting for that day. And our liturgy and our hymnal is designed to remind us of the ultimate restoration of all things. We sing in the divine service, <clears throat> this is the feast of victory for our God. Now that does, of course, refer to Christ's victory at Easter time, but that passage comes from the book of Revelation, which is all about the end of the world, when we shall stand before the throne of God and everything is restored and perfect and holy, singing his praise to all eternity. In one of our post-communion collects, we pray, keep us firm in the true faith throughout the days of our pilgrimage so that on the day of his coming, we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. So someday that's coming, the complete and total restoration of all things. But as one scholar has pointed out, there's some people who can't see it. They don't think that it's ever gonna happen that this world is so messed up, or even maybe their own lives, are so messed up, they can't see that how it's ever going to be made perfect again. It's beyond saving. As this scholar points, it, points out, they literally can't see behind their noses. They can't see beyond their noses. What's going to happen someday? For those people, we say to them, they need to hear about Jesus and the cross and the empty tomb. As Jesus says in the Gospel reading for today, repentance and forgiveness of sins shall be proclaimed in his name to all nations. When people see that in Christ all their sins are forgiven, they can then see beyond their noses to the ultimate restoration of all things. And so to get people to see that final restoration of all things, the beauty and perfection of the coming world, what we need to do and continue doing is proclaiming repentance and forgiveness of sins in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One of the great things about this vision of the complete restoration of all things is that it helps us see how every single thing that happens in this world has a meaning and a purpose. Even a snowstorm in the middle of April. As the same scholar points out, all the little bits and pieces of life which sometimes seem like they happen so randomly and don't have any meaning or purpose. But when we see the vision of the complete restoration of all things, we, what we also see is that everything that happens, every little thing, no matter how small and insignificant, all fits together in one unified whole and will all someday make sense and be understood even by our small, sinful minds, we will see it all fits together. So someday, it's going to happen. And I can assure you that of that, not just on what Jesus and his disciples said, but even all the way back to the Old Testament, many of the prophets spoke of the final restoration of all things. And for those who still can't see it, 
we have the best message of all, that in Christ and through his death and empty tomb, our sins have been completely forgiven. We are redeemed and restored and waiting for his return. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.